Hello there. The coronavirus lockdown is still on. It's getting longer. And it's a nice day. And I thought I'd make a little film, it might be two films, about some of the repairs and improvements I've made to my McConnell mobile saw bench. These machines were introduced in the post-World War II years. I think the first one emerged around 1949. And there's various models. This is the 10 DCR, which means 10 horsepower, diesel, cross-cutting and ripping. There are other versions of this saw which only do cross-cutting, some which only do ripping, and there are various engine options, including petrol, diesel and electric motors. A lot of these machines have come onto the second-hand market in recent years as people update their equipment. Here in the UK, these no longer comply with health and safety legislation for woodworking machinery which requires that the blade reach a complete stand within 10 seconds of the stop control being operated. I've toyed with the idea of fitting some kind of brake to this and I've got a few ideas on that and not done anything about it because I've been too busy sorting out all the other problems it's got. I've got a couple of other videos out on this saw performing various tasks but just to quickly show you the, the ease and the beautiful simplicity with which this converts from cross-cutting to ripping. It's just a masterpiece of bits and bobs that works incredibly well. And the great advantage of cutting firewood in this way is that the operator is not in line with the line of fire, any staples or bits of blade that come off. The operator's out of the way, perfectly safe. Another element of the design of the crosscut table is that only the downward running face of the blade is exposed. So when the saw's cutting, it's pushing your irregular shaped round log that you might want to kind of spin round and do nasty things down onto the table. A lot of table type saws, you'll see this table mode soon, are incorrectly used for cutting firewood and that use accounts for the large number of fatal accidents which occur with these machines every year. Let's just quickly convert it to the table mode and you'll see what I'm on about. So here's the saw in the table mode and to cross cut a piece of timber now for firewood purposes you have to hold the timber each side of the blade, your arm is in the line of fire, all your upper body is in the way and in fact most of the fatalities that happen with this use of a table saw firewood cutting isn't actually from the blade itself, it's from the, the blade now you've got the forwards, this, this part of the blade here is running forwards towards the operator, the rear of the blade is actually running upwards and most of the fatalities which occur and serious injuries are not because the operators got cut it's because they've had a huge chunk of timber thrown at them at many miles an hour and the impact often kills them outright so not from the blade itself of course if you've seen the cross cut table um, those risks were eliminated and when this saw was initially marketed it was marketed as a super safety machine you might not think that now might you Another quick word for the eagle-eyed. Got this in the, the table mode here. If you're using the table cut, you should have a riving knife on the back. I've, I've got one in my little toolbox. It's just not on the machine at the moment. And the riving knife prevents, if you're doing long, long cuts, prevents the timber closing up once it's reached the blade. It grips this blade, which then throws the whole lot upwards. Again, dead operator. The riving knife is just a little bit thinner than the blade prevents long cuts, the stresses in the timber closing up around the blade. 
when I had this machine, this guard was completely bent. It's clearly that happened, and, and funnily enough, there was an arriving knife on when I bought it. Wonder what happened there then. Engine. This one's a Peta AVA2 rated at 10 horsepower. The 14 DCR model, which had a larger blade, had 14 horsepower. Um, I've heard lots of people talking about putting a more powerful engine on, but really the limiting fact is the blade. If you look in publications such as Machinery's Handbook, there's a handy table telling you what horsepower is required for different sizes of blade on woodworking machines. If you put a larger horsepower engine in, won't re with this kind of blade, won't really allow you to cut any faster. Or all it'll do is choke the gullets of the blade with sawdust, or if the wood's binding, it'll heat the, heat the blade up even quicker than you otherwise would, and then you have a warped blade. Back to the engine, um, air cooled. Pretty common, these engines in the UK. The successor to this engine was the PH2, which has a larger bore and in many respects is visually identical. Um, it does have a better lubrication system and some other bits and pieces. Um, and of course it's more powerful depending on which variant you get because they're rated at different power outputs with different speed governings. Word of caution, I've seen a couple of these machines with replacement engines and they've been uh, put on for sale, you know, new engine fitted, can't find the starting handle. Hmm. And when you buy it and get it home, the engine doesn't start and you get the starting handle and still won't start. And then some smart ass like me turns up and says, oh, oh, that's an AVO2R. R means reverse rotation. So, you know, someone's bought what they think is a replacement engine, but these being industrials were available in standard rotation and reverse rotation. Um, so you start the thing up and, and it's going the wrong way. Oops. You just about see the fins, the air cooling fins here. This being an air cooled engine, particularly if you're cutting dry timber, these really look around the machine. I mean, I try to keep this clean. These get sort of covered in sawdust really quickly and that leads them to overheat. So it's really important on these air cooled engines in this application to take the cowlings off quite regularly and give it all a good clean. If your engine's leaking oil, it's really important to get that dealt with because, of course, oil attracts sawdust and makes it all worse. Mine has a paper element filter on, which, of course, is the modern equivalent of the oil bath. I thought that was a good idea. It's not. Uh, you're better off with the oil bath. They're much better at filtering out in heavy-duty applications. The paper filter, fine on wet wood, but if you're cutting dry wood, it, it'll choke in no time at all. Um, bad move. There's loads of really smart and clever features on these saws. The legs aren't one of them. In doing my work on the legs, I was keen to retain the original appearance of the machine. I could have put something more modern on, but I didn't want to do that. So I've persevered with the original design and ironed out its problem. So the first thing I did with these feet is to drill a hole in the bottom. I used to fill it with sawdust. Here's a very basic copy of the, the shape of the original leg bracket. It was kind of folded bit of thing with a circular hole in the top and one in the bottom. And the leg would just slide up and down it and there'd be a, a pin to go underneath to set the height and that was it. But, you know, they used to wobble around an awful lot and were far shy of what the manufacturers called rock steady. Two round things, one inside the other, has got a lot of squirm and, and wiggle room. Doesn't seem good. You can see I've welded in two fixed points so that the leg now rests between those and not on the bottom of the hole. So it's really resting in a, a gutter. On the front, I've put a, a locking screw and this load pad kind of shares the load. 
of the locking screw and means the screw doesn't start eating holes into the leg. And instead of having a sort of pair of pins, one on the top and one on the bottom to stop it flopping up and down, there's just one single pin hole through the middle of this now, which prevents either lifting up or sliding down. It goes in a locking mechanism. All of the modifications I've done to this saw all we'll use this tommy bar because it's easy and when you're cutting wood you don't want to be faffing around you want everything to be as easy as possible to encourage you to to have everything adjusted correctly this tommy bar fits loads of things on the machine and doubles up as the crank handle for the jockey wheel and that is its stowage back to the rear of the machine where it came from when i had these legs this area had kind of pulled and bellied out from use over the years and probably been driven off with the legs down. So I put this load spreading plate behind on the chassis. To reduce deformation of this area and to firm everything up. The thread system in use on this machine, by the way, and on the engine, uh, helpfully, is BSF, British Standard Fine. Very visually similar to UNF, Unified National Fine, but not interchangeable. That's better. The same style of easy, easy use locking bolt can be found on the main guard screw on these screws here, which hold the optional accessories onto the table. On my drawbar which can be set to two different heights depending on whether I'm towing the machine with a tractor or my Land Rover. And of course on the feet. Elsewhere on the machine, because I kind of believe in making things as easy as possible, I've replaced this nut. I mean, who's seriously going to get a spanner out to adjust a guard in the middle of a job? They're not, are they? They're just going to carry on with the guard not quite adjusted as they should and then wonder why they have an accident. So I've replaced that nut with a little T kind of thing that I made. Oh, I knew there was another one. Table screw is another of my little things all operated off the, the tool on the jockey handle. The front leg was it's my Tommy bar stowage. Front leg was similar tail of woe, very wobbly and you seem to need like a pin on the bottom and a pin on the top or you know you could put one in and you lift the drawbar to raise the machine the leg would drop down four inches till it found the pin and it was all a bit ropey um, I've actually completely re-engineered this drawbar the original drawbar is to fit a Ferguson tractor drawbar which is kind of largely obsolete now and mine was bent. Most of them seem to be. Every saw of these I've seen has had a bent drawbar. So I've re-engineered it, but used the original tube and the original foot, which oops, seems to be covered in soil. When I was using this saw at first, it's quite nice to find the thread on there, one inch BSF, but everything seemed really, really tight. And I sort of take it off and oil it and seemed fine and you put it back on the machine and next time you go to set the saw up it seemed really tight again and I went through several stages of doing this before going hang on there's a problem here. Cross section of the, the little foot pad on the drawbar as was all very basic and this represents a cross section of the end of the jockey tube and it's just a piece of one inch bar with some washers welded on the end 
it's all fine when everything was all level and square, but if you put that foot on an uneven surface and tried to go one way or the other, it'd quickly jam. No amount of oil was going to fix that. Took it all apart, made a, a dished brass bush to go in the bottom, launched a load of weld on the end of the spindle so I could dome it to suit approximately the dish and then widened this dimension here so it wasn't so tight. It's still tight enough that it won't drop out and that gives a little bit more kind of angle wiggle factor and it's a dream now. Works great. The original versions of this saw were made using wartime surplus stock and the wheels were described in the manufacturer's literature as aero wheels. I am told they are of a Spitfire aircraft. These days the wheels are worth more than the saw if they're in good condition. Later versions of the saw used steel wheels with these really quite outdated hubs that use a floating bronze bush inside. There's no wheel like taper roller bearings or ball bearings in these. It's a floating bronze bush and that's caused me a few questions. The little stub thing on here, this little bolt, says to me that it's an oil filled hub. I've had a bit of job getting oil to stay inside these. Um, there's felt seals in the back of the hub and they didn't seem to work very well and I've faffed around with different sealing materials trying to keep oil in. At the moment I'm running ISO 680 steam oil um, inside which stays in and they seem to not overheat too badly. Wheel nuts, 5 8 BSF, uh, sawdust can be quite acidic when it dries. Oak in particular creates tannic acid as it dries out and the ends of the studs which used to emerge from the wheel nuts would get covered and corroded and when you wanted to take a wheel off you couldn't and the whole lot would spin and I sort of went through several cycles of freeing them all off and thinking I'd done a proper job and then a year later finding I couldn't get them off again. So I made these closed ended wheel nuts out of um, 27 mil hexagon bar which is a standard size uh, and that happens to fit a Land Rover wheel wrench and it means that the thread is completely enclosed, doesn't get sawdust on it and hopefully there'll be no more problems. The wheels are 15 inch which is a bit of a bummer and it is the rounded profile, this kind of balloon profile which gives the saw its suspension. There is no other suspension. Lots of people told me these are obsolete. These are the original British India tyres. Um, but I have found somebody online, bigtires.co.uk, can get a tyre which is... These are 750-16s. They can get a 760-15 which is marginally bigger in diameter comes from the US, it's imported, it's a Carlisle Farm Special with the same profile, only not 50 years old. The original guard was showing signs of a hard life, had clearly had an accident at some point, had been repeatedly straightened and bent again and straightened again, but even when I straightened it out it was very wobbly, this used to kind of flap around when the engine was running. Uh, mm, There's a bit of an outdated design. This cross arm here was a piece of like three-quarter solid round bar with a bit of flat bar welded on top and none of it had great rigidity so I've replaced it with this bit of steel tube. This was a nasty bit of channel with bits welded to it and I've replaced it with some 50mm box section steel and it's a load stronger, much more rigid, less noisy because it's flapping around and I've kept this original part of the guard with a little thing on the back and just welded it straight on. At first observation it might seem to kind of be a bit short. When you're cutting timber you might think that you'd be better off extending it 
but they're deliberately this short because as you cut the timber, stresses can relieve. You want them to get, have space to do so and not be forced against the blade. It's not an oversight of design, it's deliberate and for good reason. The drawbar, I kind of pity anyone who has as difficult an axis that I do. My axis has a very steep ramp over angle and the only toe itch I can possibly use is this military ring which has fantastic articulation at a ball hitch or a pin hitch would just tear straight off because of the change in angle is very abrupt and there's nothing I can do about it. You can see how this works, it flips upside down so that I can put this behind the tractor on a pin hitch which is much lower or, or the Land Rover I imagine other people don't need hitches quite as complicated as this. The main drawbar on the machine as supplied is three by one and a half channel um, mine went in the bin. I found this 40 by 80 by 4 mil wall thickness steel box section to be a good close fit. It was quite difficult to find something that would actually fit in the machine without fouling other things. These little chains here were used by McConnell on the original manufacturer. I've only just found someone who can sell this. This is 4 mil jack chain from ironmongerydirect.co.uk or maybe .com Most people who make jack chain now do this horrible extended link stuff and it just doesn't work on these. The links are too long and it's really fiddly. When I was at it all I noticed that the, the saw runs much better when level so I bought a little bubble eye to go in which helps me level the machine without having to mess around with spirit levels, it's just permanently screwed on there in little brass housing I turned up. In this large size ammo box I've got pretty much everything you need to run the saw so you don't end up coming out somewhere and taking dangerous shortcuts in order to get the job done. There are a couple of spanners for the two main adjustments on the machine you'd ever want to make. Tape measure, marking pen, This item here is your safety device for the blade. If you're moving timber around when the table's in the loading position, it stops your hands going anywhere near the blade. This is was missing when I had it. I've made out of some 20mm electrical conduit and it seems to work okay. This stuff is fantastic for keeping sap and yuck off the blade and I kind of spray it as I go along keep an aerosol in the toolbox. Not really available in DIY short stores, you've got to go to like an industrial stockist to get it because it's got naphthalene and unfriendly things inside it. Hand brush, doesn't need any explanation. In an oil can there are little oiling points on this machine which are easily missed. I'll show you them now. On the table pivots they're normally full of sawdust, but there's one on each of the pivot points. Many saws have not had these attended to in years and it's all rusty and wearing out. I've got a separate video on YouTube called Repair of Worn Holes in Machine Chassis showing how I dealt with pivots on the, the bottom which were in a really poor state. And I've modified mine now so that I use grease nipples which seems a bit of a better setup for the bottom. Small jack for obvious purposes. Here's the roller feed for cutting longer timber, it gives you better support on the cross cutting table. In the bottom, my riving knife, Land Rover wheel wrench. This is the large spanner for undoing the um, saw spindle. Two spanners for removing the swinging frame. 
so that you can change your wheel on that side should you need to because the frame needs to be unbolted and a brass wire brush and a brass scraper for cleaning the blade up. So the exhaust on these machines is normally an industrial pepper pot silencer that just comes straight out here and fills your face with fumes as you're sewing. So I've put this angle on and I've got a tractor exhaust on which takes the fumes above your head and makes it much quieter to operate because the noise is coming out above your ears, not below them. These locking pins to limit the table swing were, like on most saws, really badly worn. They were just drilled straight through this tube um, and, and the holes had elongated and it all torn out of shape. So I filed the hole back round and central, inserted a, a one inch piece of steel rep bar with, with, a, with a hole down the middle and now there's these nice new pins in, which can be removed if required and they mean the table movement is uh, now properly controlled and, and not going any further than you need to. This little hole here in the table is for an optional accessory length stop, which I don't have, but will be really, really easy to make. So that if you're cutting long timber, you can just run it to the length, like fence posts and stuff. And lock off using another one of my little screws. Here's a part that's frequently damaged or, or even missing. And it protects the operator from the exposed part of the blade under there. Kick. The crosscut table um, kind of deforms over time and with use and ends up sagging at the point of most load. Which is where the blade passes and all the cutting forces are. When I replanked my table I, I kept finding that firewood was sort of catching on this part and wouldn't slide off. And I realised it's because these two had, had kind of cranked down like that. So I've got some little washers under there just to, to pack this piece up in order that the, the timber on top will slide off there nicely onto there. It took me a while to work out what was going wrong there. Like many saws that you see of this type, the springs are pretty knackered. McConnell don't hold any spares for these machines at all. Um, I managed to match up with an online supplier um, of springs and get these close alternatives. Once I got them, I spent a long time trying to work out what they were supposed to do. <laughs> Seems silly. But I concluded that the best setup which you can alter by changing the start position or the length of this chain is that the, the crosscut table returns to you at the end of its stroke but requires to be pushed towards the blade and this is really affected by how well you've leveled the saw which is why I've got the little leveling bubble down there. Here's the part number for the springs, which as you can see I got from Spring Masters in Redditch. These are a stock size, therefore much cheaper than getting ones especially made to order. They're pretty close, I imagine they're possibly slightly on the weak side. I also found that when you're doing a lot of firewood cutting, a lot of logs end up falling down here and jamming it up and you end up having to go in to try and remove everything. And it, got to be a bit of a nuisance. Thank you. 
this offshoot tubal I made of I think four mil mild steel I wouldn't do it that thick again maybe two and a half or three a bit heavy but it really helps bring the firewood away from the, the danger position and where it's going to cause problems and you can operate for a lot longer before needing to stop and sort your pile of firewood out The locating screws have a small diameter turned on the end which engages in a slot on the tubes of the, the offcut table so you can wind them in. Just kind of hand tight so you don't make it all jam up and that keeps the table in position and stops it from rattling out as the uh, engine's running. This is the table lock pin. This stops the table from wiggling around when you're going down the road towing it. These very nice R clips that I've got, which are all captive are called double coil R clips. It took me a while to find out what they were called but it means you can put them on a chain and, and the chain doesn't get lost. You can see on the table lock I've lots of little repairs here. This is an oversized pin that I've reamed the holes out because it's all jingly. And I've welded on a little bit of flat bar there just to make up a bit of a gap so that when the pin is in, the table is, is genuinely locked and not, not flapping round an inch and a half. For it's worth a quick look at my double height draw hitch. Again, everything's held in with double coil R clips. And everything's operated off this little Tommy bar. Quite simple really, just undo the two nuts that are kind of captive and you can flip it over for another ride height. I've got a fixed point on the main drawbar here for my safety change which as you can see is not yet fitted. These machines by the way weigh a shade under three quarters of a ton which means that they are legal to tow on the public highway in the UK that is without brakes. These don't have brakes but because they're under three quarters of a ton providing your towing vehicle is okay with that you can tow them without brakes. I've towed mine around locally. Um, haven't really gone over 40 miles an hour with it and I'm not sure that would be a good idea but tow's all right, bounces along. My other videos of this machine were recently pirated by a couple of other YouTube users who found their videos have disappeared offline. All of them have appeared in, you know, like top 10 dangerous firewood processing machines, but it's got to be remembered that when this machine was new, it was actually a revelation and won several awards for its inherent safety of design. Obviously times have moved on and, and the human race has got to make better idiots, but in its day, it was an inherently safe design and treated with respect, there's no real reason why you shouldn't avoid accidents with it. I'm particularly careful with it. Uh, I don't use it if I'm in any way bad-tempered or tired or feeling a bit not quite right. And when I'm using it I take a lot of care to make sure I've got a really good working area with no trip hazards, nice even ground. And, and as I'm working, I make sure, you know, you'll get little bits of stray log that roll across the floor. All you need to do is trip and, you know, reach out and go to steady yourself. Ugh, where's my hand gone? Um, so, sort of, just remaining conscious of what you're doing when you're operating it, I think, goes a long way. And the moment you get a bit blasé about operating one of these, that's, that's when you're going to have an accident, I think. I think I've probably just about covered everything that I've set out to. 
uh, it's all a bit vague. There's many different variants that are still that have different problems to overcome. This is really just to give some kind of ideas on how you can overcome some of the obstacles that you might find with these. These are all you know, getting on now, 70 years old, some of these. Uh, this one performs me a great service and it's got me out of loads of trouble and every time they change hands on eBay they seem to go for more and more money each time so there's obviously still people who are uh, appreciating them for what they are and a lot of people are using them not as vintage exhibits but as, as real genuine firewood processing machines. Maybe I might get around to doing some operating tips, still got on my fingers. But that'll be another video because my memory card's about full now. So I hope you enjoyed it and I might be back to bore you another time. Who knows?